Hi, my name, apparently not in the program, but my name is Steve Hickner, and I'm surprised to see this many people here. I was telling Angela, I work at DreamWorks, I was telling Angela that I thought maybe eight people would come, but I, I guess that's the advantage of uh, doing a talk like this during the recession, is that it has some <laughs> timeliness. I'm going to give you a very quick uh, capsule of, of what my career is. This year is my 30th year in animation. I started in 1979. I started on, uh, at Filmation, and I worked in TV animation for five years and amongst shows, uh, Fat Albert and He-Man, the first He-Man, which some people call the good He-Mans. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Then, then I went to Disney for the next five years, and I worked, at, um, worked on Black Cauldron, Great Mouth Detective, Little Mermaid, Roger Rabbit, and then I went to London, for Steven Spielberg, and we did uh, American Tale 2, <laughs> with the one that uh, didn't do well. And uh, we're back in Balto, and since 1994, I've been at DreamWorks. So right at, the, right at their very beginning, I directed on Prince of Egypt and the Bee Movie, and I've worked on some other DreamWorks movies. So that's quickly what I've done. And the one thing, when I was working on B Movie, there was one day where I looked at our crew list, and there was like 200 people, and out of all the people on the, on the crew, there were only two people who started in animation when I did. And so I looked at the whole crew list of everybody at DreamWorks. There must have been a thousand people, and there were only two people. It was Scott Santoro and uh, Toby Shelton. And I thought, well, what happened to all these people? And then I said, well, I started thinking of people outside that, at other studios, and basically, a lot of people are gone. And I thought, what is it that lets a person build career longevity? What is it? What are those things? And so, I've been working on a book on, on just that topic, and so when I talked to Tina, I said, I will talk about that today, because I think it's important. And the first thing I'm going to say that will separate you from people is the easiest thing, is everybody has, like in their DNA, how smart and how talented and stuff that we can't change. You know, I'm not the smartest guy, and I'm not the most talented guy, but I am one of the most disciplined people, and I, I will stick at something until I get it. And the other thing that I think that I'm good at is this thing I'm going to tell you is attitude. You can't believe how important attitude is. When I lived in uh, London, and, and when we built that studio for Amblimation, for uh, American Tale 2, we had to hire an entire studio. We hired uh, between 200 and 250 people. But in actuality, we probably hired 500 people to get those 200 people. And it, what I began, and we hired a lot of entry-level people, and what I discovered was the deal breaker was attitude. It was amazing how some people just light up the room when they come in. Actually, Robert, you, who I've known, uh, who uh, went from uh, when I went and spoke at class, he's one of these guys. He lights up the room. And you like to be around people like that. And went in a creative process, which there's nothing more collaborative than animation, which is why I love it, really. There's, in, in a live action movie, you get a writer, a director, an editor, production designer, the star, the producer. You know, you'll get maybe seven, eight, ten people, depends how extended you want to be, who make a creative big contribution. That's not to, you know, uh, discount the other people who are working on the live action movies, but on an animated movie, if you're going to hire, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio in a live action, we need 30 Leonardo DiCaprios to make that performance. And instead of one, you know, production designer, we need a whole bunch of lighters to do this cinematography, and rough layout people, and final layout people, just to do what a handful of people do on live action. So the ability to contribute to animation is why I love it. It's also why I like to work with people who are optimistic and have great attitudes, because it's impossible to make a good movie. Whenever I see one, I genuflect in front of it, I go, how did they do this? I've, I've tried them myself, and it's hard, and sometimes I've Succeeded, sometimes not. And an attitude is, is a big thing. So I'm going to 
The next thing I want to tell you is there's a little kid's rhyme. It goes something like this. Three frogs are sitting on a log. Two decide to jump. How many are left? Now, it's a trick. They want you to say one. The answer is three, because deciding and jumping are two different things. And some people don't jump. And that, for, if you want to get in the business, that's going to cut off a whole bunch of people if you jump. And by that I mean take the initiative and do stuff that nobody else will do. And let me give you an example. When I uh, came back from London on, um, uh, when we were starting, we were actually going to make the animated movie of Cats before DreamWorks came. We had this production guy who worked in the thing who didn't have any money when he moved out here. And I said, well, how did you live? And he said, well, I used to live at Universal Studios. And I go, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, I used to live in one of the houses. And when they would drive by, I would hide. But that's where I would live. I said, you're kidding me. And he goes, yeah, that's where I lived for six months because I didn't have any money. <laughs> well, that's a true story. Another one who was really creative, this is, a, this is another true story. It was a sound guy who I worked with. And I ask, I'm always asking people, how did you get in the business? Because I'm interested in that story. And he said, I wanted to work at this sound place in Hollywood. So I found out where they got their pizza. Because the sound guys always work late. He said, I found out where they got the pizza, and I got a job there <laughs> at night with the idea when they would order pizza, I would always be the one who would take it to them. And he said, I did that for about three months till they got to know me, and I told him, I'm interested in doing this, and guess what, they hired him. <laughs> this, this is a true story. This is, this is what I mean, thinking outside the box. I, I, you know, rarely anymore do you ever get mail. Sometimes somebody will actually write me a handwritten note, like a card or something. I remember those people because you don't, know, you don't get that anymore. It's always email or something or text. But the person who does something different will stand out and you'll remember them. So I'm going to give you my big rule, which is what I call never turn down a combat mission. And here's the story. Is there anybody in this room who has ever heard of, of um, Charles Slick Goodland? Please don't say yes. See, never, it's like an attorney, never ask a question you, you don't know what the answer to. Thankfully, nobody knows. But Charles Slick Goodland was one of the top guys at Bell Aircraft, and he was the one who was hired to fly the X-1 aircraft, which was the first plane that was going to fly supersonic. And back in those days, no one had ever gone supersonic, didn't know what was going to happen. And so when they asked him, do you want to fly the X-1, he said, yeah, but I need six months to train, and I want $150,000. Well, the Air Force didn't have $150,000. So they went to the number two guy, who was Chuck Yeager, who was Sam Shepard in The Right Stuff. And he said, I'll do it. And, well, before that, they said, are you interested? He says, yeah. And he says, well, how much time do you need to, to train? He goes, I'm ready to do it. Let's go. And he goes, well, how much money do you want? And he goes, well, you're paying me. So Ch Chuck Yeager, for $283 a month, became the first guy who flew the, the plane supersonic and is now in the history books. My point is, everybody who says no, who turns down a combat mission, you don't know where that will lead. And I'm going to give you a, a very, very quick, crazy encapsulation of the dumb things that happened to me that people said no, that I said yes. And that's because that's really how you get to move up the thing. Every time somebody says, yeah, no, and I say yes, I get that far. So let me quickly step back. This is going to sound like cave drawings, but I used to, uh, I started in the business not doing any drawing at all. I started shooting video testing. And there was a day that actually there were drawings, and you would shoot them under a machine on videotape. As crazy as it is, that, that was the way it was. And that's what I started. And the person I took the job over couldn't wait to get out of that room because it was a little tiny, it was sm smaller than this, and it was shells, and it was, a, it was a horrible room, and nobody wanted to work there. Now, 
I loved it because every day all the animators would bring in their work. And so I was shooting pencil tests for everybody in the studio all day long. So I had first contact with everybody in the studio. And not only that, I was right across the hallway with, from the producer, who at the end of each day would come over and sit down and chat with me. And I would chat with them while, while I would play back the, the films. I mean, the, uh, the tapes for the tests. Now, I love movies. That's another thing. You got to start seeing movies. I can't tell you. I mean, now when I go around to schools, I'm showing clips of movies to get people um, exposed to these things because that's how you get better. And I have actually been at, at schools where someone says, oh, I don't want to be influenced by other people's work. And I said, well, I said, well you, do you like Spielberg's work? Do you like Scorsese? Do you like Quentin Tarantino? They're kind of influenced by other people's work. The best people are. Can you imagine being an artist and go, oh, no, I don't want to go into a museum and look at anybody else's art. It's crazy. Being influenced is a wonderful way to recharge your batteries. But so, let me go back to this story. Anyway, so I, I did that. The producer, by talking to him, during my off time, I wrote this uh, spec script. He thought it was good, and he let me move into the storyboard department. So out of that job that nobody wanted, it was a great uh, boon to me because I got to meet all these people, all the animators, learn about timing in a way that I don't know that I would have ever had if I didn't shoot 10 hours a day those tests in repetition. Anyway, I eventually get to Disney. Now I'm working on this, um, this uh, TV special that nobody else wanted to do. So I did it, and then that, that got me on another TV special that nobody wanted to do, and I did that. Now here's another thing I'm going to tell you. Ask for opportunity, not money. When you get the chance to get a break, ask for opportunity for something new. That's how you get money. If you get money, you'll get a bump and raise, you'll get a, a couple of dollars or whatever, an hour, but it won't change your life as significantly as opportunity will. So I had worked on these two crummy TV shows at, at um, Disney Features, these uh, specials. And, I w and this is another rule. I went to go to Peter Schneider because I heard that they were going to do Roger Rabbit. They are going to build a unit in Los Angeles for Roger Rabbit. So here's another rule that one of my film teachers told me, and I only got a C minus in the class, so I'm going to confess, but he told me that he was a documentary filmmaker, and he would say, I can get just about anybody I want to be in my films. And he said, I can even get people who don't want to go on camera to be in my films. And so I'm interested. How does he do this? He says, I'll tell you how I do it. He said, I write them a letter telling, uh, and I list the questions I want to ask them, and then I ask them for five minutes of their time. He said, nobody is so busy they can't give you five minutes. So I remembered that. So I changed that to two minutes. So I knock on Peter Schneider's door, and here's another thing the teacher told me. I got to add this one. He said, when you got to talk to somebody really important, and you want to go th around the gatekeepers, and those are the people who answer the phone and like, keep you from the, those people, they, first of all, they should become your best friends. But if they're not your best friend, then you've got to go around them. And I call this the, the, the fences are down at Jurassic Park time. <laughs> what I do is I wait till 6.15, 6 o'clock, because the, the, uh, the top people don't go home. But a lot of times, the assistants head out at 6.00. So that's precisely what happened on that day at Disney. Peter Schneider was in his office. I knock on his door and I say, Peter, can I have two minutes of your time? Well, who can't doesn't have two minutes? And now I got to add something that my teacher told me about the five minute rule. He said, when you sit down and talk to that person, here's the key thing. You must ask a question that cannot be answered in five minutes. <laughs> that's the key. You got to pick. So when he had H.R. Halderman, who you may not know, who was a big Watergate conspirator, he, Halderman was not doing interviews. This guy wrote him a letter and said he needed five minutes of your time, and he sent him the questions. Well, when he sits down to the guy, the first thing you pick the most contentious question right at the beginning. 
He can't let the, when the camera's going, stop, because what he said is at five minutes, he would always look at his watch and say, I'm sorry, sir, in accordance with an agreement, uh, the five minutes is up, thank you very much for your time, and he would start to leave, and the guy would say, no, 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 let, let me finish. And that's how he would get these people on camera. But anyway, so I go to Peter Schneider and I said, can I have two minutes of your time? And here's my whole pitch. And I still remember this. I said, Peter, I've worked on two not very good shows. And I would sweep the floors. If there's an LA unit, I'd like to be considered. That's it. That was my whole pitch. Remember, ask for opportunity, not money. And what Peter said was, what have you heard about the LA unit? See, everybody loves gossip. And I said, well, I, I don't know anything except there's talk that there might be one. And he said, well, there is talk that there is one, but we don't know yet if, if there's going to be one. So uh, what, the applause has thrown me. So he, he said, <laughs> he said uh, what, what did he say? He said, uh, I'll keep you in mind. Within the week, I was the second person on the LA unit. Within two months, I was in London for Roger Rabbit with Raul. And when I was in London, now here's, Raul just happens to be here, but I'm going to bring up something. I have no idea what he's going to say, but I'm going to ask him, Raul, where did I work on Roger Rabbit? Where was my office? In the theater. I was in the theater in Roger Rabbit. Remember? I was in the theater and it was this darkened room with no air and it was horrible. Nobody wanted, no, remember? In a corner. Nobody wanted to be there. It was, I had the best office in the entire studio. And you know why? Because in the theater, every day, every single person in the whole studio came in to look at the dailies. And because that was my office, I was always there. I got to meet Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, Peter Snyder, George Lucas, <laughs> Jim Henson, uh, Steve Starkey, Bob, any, every, name them. Na uh, Bob Hoskins, you name them, they all came in that office and I got to meet every one of them. That was my second crummy office. Remember my first one? So what you think may be a crummy thing doesn't necessarily have to be so. It's how you utilize what you get because I genuinely believe that I didn't get any more chances than other people. I just capitalized every time I got one. And one of the ways you do that is you've got to give 110% all the time. You've got to, and that means being interested in movies. I mean, I love movies. I can't imagine wanting to do anything else but this, except talk about movies. Because I love, I love going. If I weren't here right now, I would probably be going to see uh, Moon, which is only at 30% of Rotten Tomatoes, but I would see it anyway. I feel like I should see that. I thought the first Twilight was actually quite good. But I watch a lot of movies, and that educates me. And I, the, fact, the, the fact that you guys are here listen, seeing these people is very good, because you want to make contacts. Because when I first started in the business, I used to go to all these screenwriting things, and I would write to the person with uh, later on and say, you know, I saw you at the blah, blah, blah thing. Would you mind reading my script or would you read this? And I can honestly say that every single person that I wrote to, and I used to do some crazy things. I will admit, I hate to say this, very few people know, but I actually, I, I actually had a cake made and I put my script in it and took it up. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not kidding. And I dressed up as a delivery person and went to Burt Reynolds' house. And, and got him to take it. I did the same thing with Sally Field, and the person wouldn't let me give it to him. And I said, oh, really? This, this won't be able to get to her? And he goes, no, no, I, no, I can't get to her. He goes, oh, I'm going to get in trouble. And he goes, well, I don't want you to get in trouble. And I go, well, I'm going to get in trouble. And he goes, all right, I'll make sure she gets it. Well, I, I, I got rejection letters from him, but I got personal rejection letters from both people. <laughs> Point is, I don't take no. Somebody's, and here's another thing, because I've just written a book and now I'm going out and I'm going to get all these rejection letters from all the people who don't want to publish it. Here's the great thing. If I were playing baseball and I went 0 for 49, I wouldn't, I'd be in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, if, if that. But 
in this world, I only have to get one yes. I can go 0 for 49 and go 1 for 50 and I win. And I'm, the sa I'm at the same place as the guy who went 1 for 1. And that's what one of my writing teachers told me. He said, and this is something, he said, this entire crazy movie business is built on the word no. Nobody gets fired for saying no. But you do get fired for saying yes. The, as executives at Universal learned this summer when their summer movies didn't do that well. Now if they had said no to all those movies, they'd still be there. And the, the crazy thing is, you can turn down, I'll give you a great example. Last year, Warner Brothers had Slumdog Millionaire. They own that movie. And they turned it down. They, first they were going to put it out on video, they decided not to, they let the, the rights go. Fox Searchlight said yes, picked it up, and it became a worldwide hit, $300 million in the best picture of last year. Now, I'm certain none of those people at Warner Brothers who said no got fired. There's no, there's no, uh, nothing bad happens if you say no in this crazy business. But if you say yes, you might be fired. Oh, I've got to wrap this up. I'm sorry. That's it. <laughs> but thank you all. Maybe I'll uh, see you. Maybe I'll see you out there.